Chief Justice Raymond Zondo has cemented himself in South African history, not only as the apex judge in South Africa's court system, but also as the person who presided over the now famous State Capture Commission. It's been about a year since that commission submitted its final report. Today, we sit down for an exclusive interview with the Chief Justice. I'm Sizwe Mbofu Walsh. Was the State Capture Commission a watershed moment in South Africa's long-running battle against corruption and fraud? Or a waste of taxpayers' money, which hasn't yielded the results that many hoped it would? Tonight, we delve into these questions. Before we do so, please take a look at this insert, which gives you some context around our conversation. Pursuant to the investigation and remedial action of the public protector. Under duress and having no way out of the rampant allegations of capturing the state, former President Jacob Zuma announced the establishment of the judicial inquiry into allegations of state capture. I have decided to appoint a commission of inquiry. Also known as the Zondo Commission on the 9th of January 2018. With the country's democracy and international standing in question, South Africans wanted answers about the widespread allegations of a head of state who was accused of a widespread capture of the state along with his close associates, politicians and a private business family, the Guptas. Today marks the first day of the first session of the hearings of the Judicial Commission of Inquiry into allegations of state capture. The commission, headed by then Deputy Chief Justice Raymond Zondo, heard 278 testimonies. Day after day, South Africans were glued to their screens as those implicated from state departments to various state entities either presented their cases or answered to allegations. Four years later, and after spending close to a billion rand, the Commission wrapped its activities with recommendations on how the state must ensure the proper governance of institutions and referrals for further investigations by law enforcement agencies. While critics complained that the Commission was a waste of state resources, some argue that it has enabled the state to make some recoveries and unpaid taxes. So far, the state's response to deal with the alleged crimes from the Commission was to establish an investigating directorate under the National Prosecuting Authority, which enrolled 26 cases, 89 investigations, and hurled 165 accused persons to court to answer alleged state capture-related offences. But the NPA has complained about the complexity of the cases and the lack of the required skills with a number of embarrassing failures, including the failure to extradite the Guptas and the removal from the role of the Nulan investment case due to the ineptitude of the prosecutor. The extent to which the governance of the state will be improved as a result of the commission is still unknown, but this raises questions about the role of the commission of inquiry and their real impact in society. South Africa's post-apartheid history of commissions of inquiry dates back to 1995 with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which heard testimonies of 21,000 victims and recommended the prosecution of 300 perpetrators of human rights violations. The state had to be forced by some families of victims to prosecute the perpetrators. This year, 28 years later, the NPA announced it will prosecute 64 cases. Since 1994, about 20 commissions of inquiries have been established investigating various state entities, including the NPA, Scorpions, the PIC, SARS Acts of State Violence Against Citizens at the Marikana Commission. 
11 years after the establishment of the Marikana Commission, the families of the victims of the indiscriminate killing of mine workers are still waiting for justice, and some police leadership have not been held to account, and no one has been found guilty of the tragic event 11 years later. Are commissions of inquiry an effective way to ensure justice for victims of state accesses and other entities in the context of a non-binding nature of their recommendations? And are they sometimes tool for politicians to be seen as doing something in front of an enraged electorate? And how can society ensure that these commissions provide quantifiable value to society? Jacqueline Mapala, Unfiltered. Chief Justice Raymond Zondo, thank you so much for joining us on Unfiltered. Thank you very much. I'm happy to be here. It's been about a year since you submitted the final report to President Ramaphosa of the State Capture Commission, as it's come to be known. I wonder what you think the main achievements of that commission have been now that we look back a year later. Well, um, I think that... Uh, uh, one of its achievements uh, is that it unearthed a lot of corruption. It told South Africans what had been happening, uh, most of which I would believe they didn't know for sure. But they may have read about it in the newspapers, but that was just untested information. Uh, but the Commission gave South Africans the opportunity to hear and see live witnesses give evidence about state capture and corruption and being subjected to questioning by members of the Commission's legal team. And um, of course, others stayed away from the Commission and um, made sure that they were outside the reach of uh, the Commission. But uh, the knowledge that South Africans obtained through the Commission is very important. Um, how state capture happened, how corruption happened, but also the Commission ensured that there were specific individuals who were identified as having been behind state capture and others as people who benefited from state capture. It also showed how some of the people who were within government were working together with those who were out to loot the resources of the people of South Africa. And of course, um, it made certain recommendations uh, to try and deal with some of the challenges and to try and make sure that steps were taken to avoid it happening again. I think none can deny that that's true, that we got to see things that we scarcely thought possible. We, we gasped, we cried, sometimes we laughed as we watched mm. the proceedings unfold. Mm. I wonder though, when you speak about the recommendations, mm. whether you are in any way disappointed one year later with the pace and the urgency with which those charged with implementing those recommendations have gone about that, that duty? Um, some of the recommendations uh, didn't need to take long to be implemented, or at least uh, I would have been happy if in regard to some of the recommendations, we could see and South Africans could see steps and measures that were taken practical measures that were taken by the government, by the president, and by parliament mm. towards ensuring that they will be implemented. At this stage, it is disappointing that uh, one can't see much evidence of uh, some of the recommendations that were accepted by the president uh, one can't see and it doesn't see any evidence of them being implemented or measures being taken towards their implementation. Of course, uh, there are certain agencies and government agencies that one knows are doing something, but it's taking long. But those that um, uh, 
needed the president to make the necessary decisions. Uh, one doesn't see uh, measures uh, having been taken a year later to show that they are being implemented. You might recall that there are some uh, recommendations which he said he re would refer to certain groups that were or task teams that were to advise him on certain matters so that they could look at them as well and then advise them. I'm not aware that he has announced that those task teams have come back to him and what they have said about it. I know that he had also said that by March this year, uh, there was, uh, I think there was a certain recommendation that he said um, uh, something would be, have been taken to parliament, if I, can remember, if I remember well. But there are some measures that he were going to have happened by March of this year. I'm not aware that they have happened. And um, knowing that uh, we are about a year away from elections next year, and knowing that uh, political parties start campaigning some months before elections, I am very concerned that soon political parties and government uh, personalities, ministers and the president will be involved in campaigns for next year's elections and the issue of the recommendations of the commission will, will be something that will be seen later. So that's part of where, what is concerning me. Uh, so it, it is a pity that uh, uh, one doesn't see much in terms of proof of implementation. Could I go a bit deeper on that? Because mm. the president released a very long document soon after receiving the report, mm. which expanded on his speech about mm. how he was going to implement mm. some of these recommendations. Mm. And in particular, around about paragraph 51, mm. there were recommendations about four members of his executive in mm. your report. Mm. Minister Mandashe, mm -hmm. uh, Deputy Minister now Masobo, mm -hmm. um, Minister Kumbuzo and Javeni, mm -hmm. and now Minister Zizi Godwa. Mm -hmm. All four of those mm -hmm. were people who were highlighted in your report, mm -hmm. in his executive. Mm -hmm. All four have not only survived on his executive, mm -hmm. but some have actually been promoted. Mm -hmm. And in fact, you, having pointed out uh, now Minister Godwa's uh, wrongdoing, Mm. to some extent, mm. were made to swear him into office. Mm. How does that make you feel after your very serious recommendations and the fact that certainly as far as the executive is concerned, it does seem a year later that there's been very little action taken against those who you pointed out in the report? Well, it was, uh, uh, it's very disappointing. Unfortunately, it uh, sends a very wrong message to the public. You, you see, there could have been a situation where the president didn't do anything. And that would still be unsatisfactory. But where the message is sent to the public that uh, those findings that have been made don't mean anything. Actually, the message being sent to the people uh, is you can have serious findings made against you by as serious a body as a commission of inquiry, a judicial commission of inquiry, but that won't stand in your way to promotion, even while those findings stand. I think it's a very wrong message to be sent, sent, sent out to people. But that is what, what has happened. And uh, it is disappointing. There is a lot in that report. There are many different kinds of recommendations. Mm. Of course, there are ones that the president could have implemented quite quickly, which regard his own executive. Mm. But there are also a series of quite systemic and structural recommendations that have been made. And the one I want to focus on mm. is the creation of a national, 
a new body, mm. uh, a new task force, a new commission mm. to fight corruption, mm. anti-corruption commission, which mm. would be constitutionally protected. Mm. Now, again, the government ultimately has to institute and take steps to mm. produce such a, a wide-ranging and new institution. Mm. The president uh, suggests that the National Anti-Corruption Advisory Council mm. will be looking into this. Mm. I had a look at their most recent announcements, mm -hmm. and it seems to me all they've done in the last year is mm. create quote-unquote work streams mm. to look into how this new mm. body might be created. Mm -hmm. Again, that, that doesn't seem like it has the urgency of creating a new body mm. We seem to be advising, creating mm. work streams, and mm. not actually getting on with the business mm. of taking these recommendations, wide-ranging, deep-seated mm. recommendations, mm. seriously. Mm. Well, there, there are two there are at least two bodies that uh, uh, we recommended. There are a number of them, but at least two. Uh, there was uh, the anti-corruption agency, which one should. Uh, distinguished from the Anti-State Capture and Corruption Commission. Uh, I think you have in mind the, the agency that, that you, you, you're talking about. That agency is very important. And um, I was happy that uh, in his response, the president seemed to accept the need to have that agency. Because a lot of corruption happens around tenders. And that agency was to focus on procurement tenders. And I believe that if it's established and uh, it's, um, it starts working the way we saw it in the commission, I believe that it would go a long way in making a very serious dent on corruption in South Africa. It might take long, but if it is supported properly in terms of resources and it gets people of integrity who get, get to, 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 to work it f for it, I think it would mark, make a very serious dent on corruption in South Africa. Uh, Chief Justice, could, could I stop you there as we go yes. to a commercial break? We'll yeah. be back straight after that to delve deeper into these yeah. questions okay. of anti-corruption agencies. Okay. Stay with us on Unfiltered. We're in an exclusive conversation with Chief Justice Raymond Zondo. Welcome back to Unfiltered. We're in an exclusive conversation with Chief Justice Raymond Zondo. Chief Justice, we were just discussing the wider and more structural attempts mm. to deal with corruption and mm. mentioning the various proposals you were speaking about the, the anti-corruption agency yes. also moves to mm. have an independent division within the npa mm. to investigate mm. and then there's the anti-corruption yes. commission yes all of those seem to be well let's just say i wouldn't say moving at the pace of a snail's crawl mm. but something similar yeah well, some maybe not moving at all. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, you know, I'll just take half a, half a minute mm. to say about the agency, the anti-corruption agency. You know, the powers that we envisage it would have mm. would include surprising people in government departments when they are not expecting, mm. when they've got information that there is some corruption going on about tenders, surprising them without announcing and demanding certain documents. And, um, and, uh, and, and they would really, I believe, be quite effective. But when it comes to the uh, anti-corruption, anti-state capture and corruption commission, mm. we envisage that that commission would be very much like the commission that I chaired, but it would now be a standing commission. But one, one of the reasons uh, why uh, we came up with it, with that recommendation, was to try and answer the question, what measures must be put in place to make sure that state capture doesn't happen again? Because throughout the period of the commission, uh, this question was in my mind that this commission needs to come up with measures as to 
what needs to be done to make sure that what happened to this country through the state capture doesn't happen again. And I realized um, after the president and uh, Mr. Mantashi had given evidence on behalf of the ANC and what they had said about uh, what was expected of members of the ANC in parliament, I realized that um, if one thought that uh, if state capture was to happen almost in the same way as it happened, uh, if one thought that uh, parliament would be able to stop it, uh, it looked like there wasn't sufficient evidence for that. You know, there would always be pressure on members of the majority party to uh, support their leader. And therefore, we thought that there should at least be a body where, for example, if there are allegations of corruption and state capture, the majority party tries to sweep things under the carpet, that commission could look for people who may have information about that, collect evidence, investigate, and effectively be able to call a sitting president to appear before the commission, ministers to appear before the commission and answer questions about those issues, questions that maybe they may have been protected from in parliament and answer those questions when the whole nation is watching. So we thought that once you have that kind of situation and maybe in a particular case, a lot of evidence uh, was shown, the pressure of public opinion could well force a sitting president to resign. But because otherwise, if you don't have that and you have I'm not speaking about any particular president, but any president, if they are protected by the majority in parliament, whoever the majority may be in the future, then they, you can say whatever you want to say, they'll just continue. But if they know that there is this risk, that they'll be called to this commission and be forced to answer, and if there is a lot of evidence that comes out, the public opinion could prevail, that could help. Chief Justice, we were talking about the government's implementation of the State Capture Commission's recommendations. We've mm. spoken about the president, but of course the president wasn't the only mm. party responsible for implementation. Mm. The Ministry of Justice, mm. as well as the NPA, mm. also had some implementation mm. questions. Mm. I wonder whether you feel that questions of legislative amendments. So there were wide-ranging wide proposals mm. around mm. amending the NPA Act, mm. amending protections to whistleblowers. Mm. Mm. I looked quite long and hard for any mm. celebratory press statements mm. about those legislative achievements, but they still seem to be mm. gummed up in the legislative works. Mm. Well, I certainly am not aware that... Uh, uh, anything has been put before Parliament. I know the Minister of Justice said they were working on um, uh, either amendments or new legislation relating to whistleblowers, uh, but I haven't heard that anything has been placed before the uh, before Parliament uh, in terms of a bill. Uh, so I don't know how far they are. Uh, indeed, I've not heard of uh, any developments in regard to any legislation, uh, legislative amendments or reforms that were supposed to, to happen. Um, as far as Parliament itself is concerned, it was uh, meant to consider certain recommendations that relate to its own functioning. Um, I don't know how far they are, but I've read some things in the media recently which do not suggest that uh, uh, the matter has been given any priority. That's the impression uh, I got from what I read in the media. It may or may not be the true picture, but that's the impression I got. So it, it, it doesn't look like uh, uh, a lot has been done. On the question of public opinion, mm. I think maybe one of the charges that has been brought against the commission is... Mm the cost that, mm. that it took. Mm. 
we heard figures of around a billion rands, and that was in 2021. Mm. Uh, are you aware of exactly how much the cost was? And do you think that the cost was justified given the large expense and the long duration? Uh, well, the cost uh, was, I don't have the exact figures, but uh, it was um, around a billion rand, maybe just a little above. But when one says that, I always say, people must uh, remember that we announced that while the commission was going on, we actually recovered, I think, about 700 million rand uh, through the work of the commission. So when we, uh, that is now from uh, certain entities which had uh, been paid money uh, corruptly. Uh, so when uh, one says the commission cost about a billion rand, one needs to remember it, uh, it made sure that about 700 million rand was paid back. That's apart from whatever refunds may have been achieved by other entities. So in effect, it ended up costing uh, us, you know, less than one billion rand if you take that into account. But I have no doubt in my mind that the cost was justified. Even if we had not recovered that 700 million rand, the cost was justified in terms of the, the knowledge and information that South Africans were able to gain from the processes of the commission. The evidence that we're able to have that showed us who was involved in what. And the fact that from then on, the uh, police, the law enforcement agencies, the NPA, they would work on the basis of that evidence. They would not be starting from scratch if they investigate. And uh, of course, the commission made sure that the whole nation was able to focus on this problem of state capture and corruption. Stick with us. We're in an exclusive conversation with Chief Justice Raymond Zondo. We'll be back after this to delve further into these questions and also inquire around the judiciary more broadly. We'll be back after the break. Welcome back to Unfiltered. We're here at the Constitutional Court in the office of the Chief Justice, and I'm in an exclusive conversation with Chief Justice Raymond Zondo. Chief Justice, we were talking about the costs of the commission before, mm. and you defended the costs. Mm. I suppose the further question is, yes, there may well have been recoveries, but mm. had we deployed that money to the NPA, to, I dare say, the courts, mm. to other agencies, maybe would we have seen more action more quickly? So I suppose there's one question about how much the commission cost, but also what could have been done in the same justice area with that money? Well, they may, they, they may, it may have been used in, in other ways, but it depends what you want, you know. If you're going to spend money, you have to decide what you want to achieve. As far as I'm concerned, part of what uh, needed to be achieved in South Africa is to have an understanding of how this whole state capture project happened. And um, uh, you, would, you would only have achieved that and maybe not fully uh, in terms of criminal investigations and criminal prosecutions when you have trials. And you might not, uh, you might not uh, have the whole story because in a criminal trial, for example, the accused has the right to just keep quiet uh, and see how, what, what the state has to prove that they are guilty. Whereas in the commission, uh, we had uh, regulations, for example, that were to the effect that if you came and gave evidence and you, oh yeah, if you gave evidence and you may, you may incriminate yourself or whatever, whatever evidence you gave would not be used against you in, in court. So, so that you would not have in a criminal trial. So, yeah. Could I come on to some broader questions? Because the, the question of the cost of the commission is also linked to the wider way that we fund the criminal justice system and indeed the administration of justice. Mm, mm. And the office of the chief justice, of course, of which you're head, mm. has been complaining for a long time now mm. that its budget is, mm. is diminishing 
mm. and that that is compromising its ability mm. to administer justice. Are you mm. worried about the way that the government, the executive, the legislature are not giving you the funds as mm. the office of the chief justice necessary mm. to discharge your important duties? Mm. Well, let me begin by saying that uh, I accept that um, these are difficult econo uh, uh, economic times. I accept that the demands are more than the resources. There is so much more everyone wants to do, uh, but the money, the funds are not enough. So I, I accept that. So when we get less than we believe we should get, we know, we know that in other departments, the same thing is happening because of, of challenges. But nevertheless, it's very important that everything should be done on the part of the executive to ensure that we have enough funds, at least to ensure that certain basic uh, needs are met because if the criminal justice system, and if the justice system doesn't work well, that has got far reaching implications for society and everybody else that could take long to undo. So it's very, very important. We don't get enough funds. We continue to ask for more, but we do accept that uh, the economy is bad and that there are many demands on the public press. Before Parliament recently, the Office of the Chief Justice was updating on what seems to be an irregular IT tender, which was offered to people who worked in the office and then left and then were beneficiaries of, of a tender, which they seem to know about. Are you concerned that not enough is being done to pursue that fully? Or do you feel that that unfortunate situation within the Office of the Chief Justice is being handled appropriately? Well, on the information I have, I think it's being handled uh, properly. There is litigation that is going on as well about it. But uh, on the information I have, I think it is being handled properly. Of course, it's it's uncomfortable that the office the, of, of chief justice which of is, is so important now yes. has these yes. irregu ir alleged irregularities around it yeah. um, does that give you some disquiet that you're now having to deal with questions that in many ways you have been at the forefront of of fighting yes no uh, i'm very concerned about it and of course uh, the, the the newspapers will put my picture on the front page yeah. when they have these stories as if I've got anything to do with it. Um, no, I'm very concerned about it. And um, uh, of course, this happened uh, just after uh, I'd been uh, chairing the commission. Uh, so it's something that is that uh, you know caused me quite some concern. I'm very concerned that uh, there is this thing that happened. We're in an exclusive conversation here at the Constitutional Court with South Africa's Chief Justice. Join us after the break as we delve further into questions of justice, state capture and accountability in South Africa. Welcome back to Unfiltered and our conversation with Chief Justice Raymond Zondo. Chief Justice, how is load shedding affecting your work and the work of South Africa's judicial system? It's affecting the courts, the operation of the courts uh, very, very badly. Um, uh, some courts uh, do have generators, others don't have. Some of those which do have generators the generators are not working properly. Uh, I was told recently of a story in Limpopo where uh, there is a generator, but for some weeks there, there was no diesel. Mm. Uh, so the generator could not be used. Uh, so the result is that courts end up sitting 
fewer hours uh, than they would normally do. And that means uh, cases don't get finalized quickly. A case that could have been finalized in one day might end up being taking two days. A case that might have taken one week might end up taking two weeks. So it's a very disruptive. Um, uh, it's 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 load 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 shedding, but uh, also there are courts where there have been challenges arising out of water outages. Here in the constitutional court, ourselves we have been subjected to that huh. uh, of late. Uh, uh, we have we had, had we had to do some hearings virtually because there was no water in the building. That has happened quite uh, uh, frequently of late. Um, uh, so all of these things create challenges, but courts are affected in a very serious way by load shedding and cases are taking longer because of that. Chief Justice, you said the Constitutional Court has had to go to virtual hearings because it didn't have water in the building. Mm. That is a sad indictment on, on the crisis of service delivery that our, our country is facing mm. at the moment. Mm. For, for there to be no water in the Constitutional Court and there to be no hearings, that's quite a sad moment for our country. Mm. Well, the, the hearings did take place, but they took place virtually instead of in person because during uh, the years of COVID, we were having virtual hearings, but uh, we stopped virtual hearings sometime last year, I think, and we went back to normal hearings. So, but when there is no water in the building, in the consular court building, it means people can't come and stay here for a long time when there's no water. And uh, therefore, we would switch over to virtual hearings in order to make sure that the hearings did not get postponed because we could not uh, have in-person hearings. So we, we ended up with virtual hearings. Of course, sometimes virtual hearings, you know, go smoothly. Sometimes they don't go smoothly and there are technical challenges. And in one of them, recently we had quite a few technical challenges. Uh, with regard to the water situation, uh, apparently uh, load shedding has an impact uh, on, um, on water in terms of of uh, pumping of water and so on. When it has happened for a number of hours, load shedding, <coughs> it affects that. And that's how we were told we were getting affected. Um, uh, various uh, uh, measures are being taken to try and uh, solve this problem, right. uh, including uh, getting maybe a water tank that can last us as for a certain period of time when there is uh, no water so that we continue. Um, so hopefully that will be sorted out soon. Could, could I ask you mm. one final question briefly mm. yeah. on, on the virtual hearings? The Supreme Court of the United States mm. has audio recordings of all of their hearings. Yeah. The British or the UK Supreme Court, now you can watch all of those. Do you think it's time for South Africa to move to recordings accessible to the public of all constitutional court hearings? Well, at, at, at the moment, uh, as far as I know, you can access uh, on YouTube, uh, you know, our our hearings. The virtual so, hearings. The virtual hearings. But not virtual the hearings. ones. Yes, yeah, the virtual hearings. Certainly during the COVID uh, years, a lot of people actually were pleased yeah, with, with that. With yeah. that, yeah. So, so, so we... We, 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 we want to uh, go on with times, change with times. We, we, we want to make sure that uh, we take advantage of technological developments. On the subject of the court, which you lead, mm. of course, you in some ways had a period where you were finishing off the report still mm. on the court. Mm. And that also in some ways prevented mm. you from presiding over a number of matters. Mm. Do you think that in any way detracted from the court's capacity to have a full bench of legal minds addressing its questions? Well, of course, you know, uh, 
the ideal situation is that if the constitution says there should be 11 uh, uh, justices, then there should be 11 justices hearing matters. And uh, But the reality is that sometimes we are not able to sit 11. We, 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 sit, we sit less than 11. I believe that during that time that you are talking about, I don't think that uh, my being away compromised anything in terms of uh, the court uh, being able to do its work. My colleagues uh, were able to carry on and uh, I'm satisfied that uh, the the work of the court was not compromised at all. There's been a long period of acting justices in the court as well. Are you concerned about vacancies and there not being enough permanent justices? Well, uh, at the moment, uh, we have only one vacancy. Uh, there was a time uh, a few years ago when we had quite a few vacancies and there were challenges in, in filling them. So at the moment we have got one vacancy, but that vacancy has been there for quite some time. And um, we, we, are, we are not advertising it for the October interviews uh, as well. Part of the problem why it has not been filled is that we have not had enough responses from potential candidates, judges who make themselves available. Uh, this last time, uh, we didn't have interviews for the constitutional court, even though that vacancy was there and it had been advertised, simply because we didn't have enough numbers of candidates. So that continues, but at the moment, we are not advertising it because we want to uh, try and get more judges to come and act so that we create a bigger pool. So that when we advertise it for next year, April next year, hopefully we can have a greater response from candidates. Are you concerned about the court's productivity? I think this year, the, by the end of April, there'd been 12 judgments released, which is less than usual. Is the court not keeping pace, the, the kind of high pace that it used to keep? Well, put it this way, the, the load of the court has increased uh, tremendously since the increase in its jurisdiction. Uh, the, the, there are so many more cases than there used to be, but the number of judges remains the same. So if in the past judges, for argument's sake, were doing 100 cases, suddenly now they find that maybe they are doing 400 cases. The, the number is the same. You, you shouldn't have that situation. But it's accepted that that's the number that the Constitution gives to the court. And the other challenge is that, unlike, for example, the Supreme Court of Appeal, the Constitutional Court sits and bank. That means for every case, all 11 justices must uh, be involved and take a decision. Whereas with a court such as the SCA, there may be 22, 23, 25 judges, and they can you can break them up into uh, panels of three, panels of five. So if you have got 100 cases to be done, they can be done in maybe half the time that it would take us to do them because they can sit um, uh, five and three. So, so, so certainly there have been we have been taking longer to hand down judgments in a number of cases. There are cases where we have handed, that, handed judgments down reasonably quickly, but there are others where we have delayed, and, but it's basically because of the workload. Yeah. You're not left with much time, actually, as Chief Justice. Your tenure was destined to be a short one. Mm -hmm. I believe in August next year, yeah. you'll be concluding your tenure. Yeah. I wonder if you could just reflect as we close out this interview on what it has been like to serve as the Chief Justice and what you think your legacy will be as Chief Justice of South Africa. Well, it has been a special privilege and honor to serve as Chief Justice. I think that uh, in any country, if you are given the opportunity to serve as Chief Justice, you should really feel honored and privileged. Um, to serve your people in that capacity. That's how I regard it. But it's something that makes me to be more committed to serve the people of South Africa to the best of my ability. With regard to 
uh, the work that uh, I have been doing since I was appointed. Uh, to a very large extent, I've been focusing on trying to make sure that the Constitutional Court deals with challenges that it has had in recent times uh, so that it works better. And my colleagues and I are working very hard on that. But at the same time, I am working with the heads of court from different uh, high courts, divisions, and the Supreme Court of Appeal on broader issues. Uh, we have a program that is going on where uh, aspirant uh, women uh, judges are being trained, especially they are being trained over a number of months because we want to make sure that in due course we can increase the representation of women in the judiciary. So, yeah. Absolutely. Well, Chief Justice, they say if you're ever sitting in front of a judge, make sure that it's not the judge who's asking the questions. <laughs> so <laughs> You make sure. <laughs> exactly. So thank you so much for taking the time, uh, being accessible enough for an interview of this length. And thank you for your time in this interview. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us on Unfiltered. Continue the conversation on social media at SABC Unfiltered. And we look forward to hearing from you as we continue this conversation. Don't forget to join us for the next installment. Good evening.